From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Anne-Marie Hordern, I'm Joe Matthew. Fourth time's the charm. Congressman Mike Johnson of Louisiana is now the Speaker of the House of Representatives. With the 217th pick <laughs> in the race for Speaker in the 3rd District of Arkansas, selects Mike Johnson. Hey, The four-term congressman facing a mountain of challenges now as he assumes the gavel from the upcoming November 17 deadline for a government shutdown to the emergency request from the Biden administration for funding for Israel, Ukraine, and the border. We'll discuss it all this hour. Joining us is former communications director for Kevin McCarthy, Matt Sparks, and former acting White House chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney. Joe, it is not Groundhog's Day <laughs> for once, it no. feels like. Uh, in more than 20 days in Washington, like D.C. Morning, yeah, weren't sure if he was going to get there, but he got today. there. 217, he was able to make it on the floor. Not a single member of the Republican conference voted against him. After what we saw for Jim Jordan, Steve Scalise, Tom Emmer, it was like a completely different day. And those individuals have a tremendous amount of experience in mm -hmm. legislating and part of this leadership team. This person, less so. Maybe that's sure. why he was able to get to 217. That's one of the narratives today. He didn't have enough time, enough experience to make enemies that would stop him uh, in this quest. But, you know, one of the other jokes today was how many people were Googling uh, this name, Mike Johnson. He's not exactly a household name from Shreveport, Louisiana, 51 years old. He used to be a uh, conservative radio talk show host before he, uh, you know, became an expert in constitutional law and came to Washington. This is just the beginning, though. This mm -hmm. is the hard part that starts now. Yeah. Definitely the back end of this. What does this mean for November 17th when we're expected to have another government, not another, because they avoided it last time and it cost Speaker McCarthy his job, but a potential not government true. shutdown. Mm -hmm. Just again today, the president is requesting another supplemental for emergency funds, $56 billion domestic use for that. Mm -hmm. On top of that $100 billion, they're requesting for national security partners. Would you like to have that job? Very difficult. Uh, the first order of business, though, is a resolution on the floor to support Israel in its war against Hamas. Yeah, they just called for that. They just called for this vote. So um, a lot of those individuals will be running right back in. And he said earlier today that that would be what his uh, first call of business would be. We would right. want to stand with yeah. Israel. Let's hear from the new speaker, the 56th speaker of the House, in his call to govern. I want to say to the American people, on behalf of all of us here, we hear you. We know the challenges you're facing. We, we know that, uh, that there's a lot going on in our country domestically and abroad, and we are ready to get to work again to solve those problems, and we will. Joining us now are Bloomberg's Laura Davison and Julie Fine. Our reporters are here to give their insights on what is happening on Capitol Hill. All right, Laura, let's start with you. You've covered uh, Congress. You might have been one of those individuals that uh, Eric Wasson the other day said it feels like in Longworth, uh, an airport. People are just starting to now, like, sleep on the edge of the wall waiting for this to happen. What are you hearing from people in Congress about this new speaker? One, they're happy that it's done. Uh, they are, uh, you know, Republicans in particular, uh, you know, have spent three weeks fighting with each other, um, fighting in the press, yelling at each other behind closed doors and are ready uh, to put this behind them. Uh, but there's a lot of questions about what happens next. Mike Johnson, as you mentioned, is not super well known, uh, both inside Washington as well as outside Washington. And he was intentionally uh, very light on details, though, specifically about how he's going to govern. So he laid out a plan uh, to do a continuing resolution, a stopgap spending bill, uh, um, because there's frankly just not enough time to, to get the government funded in the next three weeks, because the past three weeks have been all about picking the next speaker. Uh, but some of these thorny issues that are going to, that dogged McCarthy, that are going to continue to be a problem, things like Ukraine, Israel aid, um, what level you fund the government at, um, are going to be um, issues that he's going to have to contend with and would really test his leadership style, which is frankly uh, unknown. Well, a lot of these are on Elizabeth Warren's mind. We heard from the Democratic senator earlier uh, weighing in on the emergency funding proposal in a conversation with Bloomberg. These are threats ultimately to the United States. War in the Middle East is not good, not only for the people who live there, but not good for the United States. Letting Russia 
overrun Ukraine is not good for the United States. So saying we have an emergency package to put all of these things together, it's the right way to handle it. It should definitely be separated. Again, there's strong bipartisan support to provide whatever Israel needs so it can defend itself. Uh, whether you agree or disagree, support for Ukraine is more controversial. So let's get the support, you know, speeding its way to Israel and not let it get bogged down to try and tie to Ukraine. Senator Ron Johnson there as well with the Republican perspective, at least for some. Julie Fine, I want to hear from you on this because there's no assumption that all these monies will pass in one bill. Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan and border security. How is this Republican conference going to manage the request from the White House? Well, the Republican conference has a lot ahead right now, and they're doing it again, as you touched on, with somebody that not a lot of people know very well. So clearly they're going to handle Israel first, but then there's going to be questions immediately about Ukraine along with the border. So I think what the Republicans are going to have to do is, first of all, show some faith in the speaker. The speaker's going to have to show how he's going to lead and immediately get something passed for Israel. A lot of uh, lawmakers, Julie, have been exhausted by this entire process, and many of them said they're hearing from constituents back home outside the Beltway who are talking about the fact that this is chaotic and a circus. What are, you, what are you hearing from, you know, you're in Texas, you're getting a different perspective than we are. What are you hearing from people who just want to see Washington get back to doing their jobs? This is one where I think nationally you're hearing basically the same thing. Like, get your work done. You have to be there. We put you in place to be there. So now at this point, just get your work done come together and enough of this already. I mean, it was three weeks, but it seemed much longer. And for people that were waiting to see action specifically on Israel and on Ukraine, they were frustrated. I heard it here. You heard it there. At this point, they just want to see something get done and they want it to be done quickly. And then with the realization that pretty soon you have to get around to funding the government, which is not something that Congress gets done quickly. Laura, is this new speaker someone who's going to work across the aisle with the Democratic leader in the House. Is he on the phone with Hakeem Jeffries later today? Maybe they've already spoken. You might have some news on that. And will there be a partnership here, or will this be uh, an antagonistic relationship? That is something that Johnson mentioned specifically today, that he looks forward to um, to working with Democrats. You know, there was a call with Biden today. Um, Chuck Schumer issued a statement saying he was looking forward to speaking yeah. with Johnson, same with, with Jeffries. Um, but this is going to be um, a real test because um, it's easy to sort of say, you know, yes, I want to work with Democrats. Mm -hmm. That is the whole kind of thing that polls well. And he will have to work with Democrats because there's a Democrat in the White House and the Senate is in Democratic hands. Uh, but he's going to have, again, his right flank there that's always kind of, you know, pressuring him, saying don't make deals, don't cut deals. Mm -hmm. And so how he how he manages that will be very difficult because he doesn't really have relationships with any of these people. Um, he can start out potentially on the right foot, but this is going to be a, a sort of a tightrope for him to walk. In the, in the next few weeks. We also heard from President Biden today, not just congratulating yeah. uh, Representative Mike Johnson, but also when he was standing with the Australian Prime Minister, he also addressed what is going on in Israel. Israel has the right, and I would add, a responsibility to respond to the slaughter of their people. And we will ensure Israel has what it needs to defend itself against these terrorists. That's a guarantee. That does not lessen the need for to operate in a line with the laws of war, for Israeli has to do everything in its power, Israel has to do everything in its power, as difficult it is to protect innocent civilians. That's difficult. This, at times, has been a hard needle for this president to thread. Of course he's going to come out and absolutely condemn Hamas's massacre, that October 7th massacre on Israel, and say, we stand shoulder to shoulder with Israel. But he's also being pressured, isn't he, by a lot of progressives in Congress to do more when it comes to the Palestinians living in Gaza. Yeah, and this is, you know, part of the whole package there is, is humanitarian aid in there. But he's getting a lot of pressure from, again, you know, his left flank. You know, we talk about Mike Johnson worried about his right flank, right. that this is going to be an issue um, that, it, that is a little tricky for him to, to navigate. And, you know, as the conflict goes on, as the humanitarian crisis on the ground gets worse, those cries are only going to get louder. Um, you heard from both Biden last week when he was in Israel, as well as today from Emmanuel Kron when he was in Israel, saying, you know, look, let's move slowly, let's move carefully and deliberately. 
deliberately, let's not make the mistakes that the U.S. made after 9-11 of sort of barreling right in and, you know, think more uh, uh, d diligently about how the response to the October 7th attacks are played out so that you don't hurt civilians. At this point, they are, they haven't gone in for a full-on ground invasion, but innocent lives are being are being lost. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Laura Davison and Julie Fine for joining us today. Momentous day as we finally have a speaker. Coming up, we're joined by former communications director for former speaker Kevin McCarthy. That's Matt Sparks. He's coming up next right here on Balance of Power. This speaker's office is going to be known for decentralizing the power here. My office is going to be known for members being more involved and having more influence in our processes in all the major decisions that are made here for predictable processes and regular order. We owe that to the people. And there's your new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, speaking this afternoon in the Speaker's rostrum after winning the gavel. We bring in now Matt Sparks, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Speaker Kevin McCarthy, current communications strategist. Good to see you, sir. Welcome back to the table. Thanks for having me. Um, we have so many questions <laughs> for you, and I can't imagine what's going through your head as the world shifts again. What was different this time? What happened overnight? And how long is this man going to keep the job? I think fatigue set in. Um, and... What Speaker Johnson had that the other candidates didn't have uh, was kind of a lack of record in leadership positions, right? So uh, I think that is helpful in a lot of ways. And you had mentioned that, you know, you don't create enemies in that time or you're not forced to make decisions that make some members upset while other members, you know, are happy. So there's a lot about leadership that, you know, kind of erodes some some trust or goodwill with, with certain groups of members. It's a really, really hard job. And so I think ultimately the members were just fatigued. They were ready to move on. They wanted to, uh, to put a speaker in place and, and kind of and move forward. But without having those leadership credentials and really the experience of legislating on that level, mm -hmm. this would mean that this is a weaker speaker than, say, a Kevin McCarthy or even potentially a Steve Scalise. So why does the conference want someone who does not have the CV? Well, I think the speaker is, is obviously an immensely important job, but there's a leadership team around the speaker. And the leadership team that's around Speaker Johnson right now is well-established. It's a strong team. Uh, Majority Leader Steve Scalise is going to have to step up and play a really you know, significant role, outsized role for a majority leader, uh, because the, the learning curve is, is steep, really, really steep. And, you know, you, if you're in leadership, you could be in leadership for many years. When you get to the speaker level, you still aren't prepared for a lot of things that kind of fall into your lap. So coming from outside of that orbit in is, is, is going to be jarring. But there is a strong leadership team in place around Speaker Johnson to kind of help with that transition. So tell us what this 51-year-old from Shreveport is in for. You actually know firsthand he's about to get a massive security detail. He has a bunch of people he needs to hire. I mean, he's is, third in line to the president. Absolutely right. How is Two, his life going to change? Well, that's true after Kamala. Yeah. Um, how does his life change now? Well, it's it's going to change completely. It's going to. I mean, his former life is going to be. It just a couple of totally days ago, different. he didn't even know he would be in this position. That's probably true. Yeah. Uh, so I think the, the as Speaker of the House, you're not just second in line to the presidency, but you're in charge of the the, the congressional institution. Uh, and so there's staff, there's career staff that, that you're in charge of, from groundskeeping to architect of the Capitol. So he's going to have to be kind of up, right up to speed on those type of responsibilities. And then there's a big ceremonial aspect of it as well. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of that stuff, there's staff around, around him that, I said, are career staff. And those things kind of just fall right into place. I think the bigger, uh, the bigger challenge is going to be the political challenges ahead. And, you know, how they're going to navigate a pretty consequential fall. We're all talking about the spending bill or the spending deadline, as we should. But there are still other deadlines, such as Section 702, mm. that's going to expire at the end of, at the, end of the year, which, is, which would be a heavy lift for, for the most experienced speaker. Yeah. Um, so, 
it, a lot of that kind of institutional stuff, it, it takes some time, but it's, it's, not, it's not too difficult because there is a really, really talented staff that works you know, in Congress mm -hmm. to help transition that through. Mm -hmm. When he comes out and he says we can have a continuing resolution to January 15th or April 15th, it says to me that that stopgap funding measure that McCarthy put on the floor, that continuing resolution wasn't the re real reason why he was ousted. Right. It was basically a cover to want to oust him. But when I think of Speaker McCarthy, he was a prolific fundraiser. That is such an important job that people don't really talk about. Sure. About having that gavel. Mm -hmm. Can you see a Mike Johnson bringing in the money so Republicans keep their seats next November? Well, he's going to have to work really hard to do so. As you mentioned, Speaker McCarthy raised close to a billion dollars in the years that he was the, the leader of congressional Republicans. And those are tremendous, tremendous shoes to fill. And I don't suspect Speaker Johnson will fill them right away. Uh, but I think for a lot, just as a lot of the country doesn't know who Speaker Johnson is. I think a lot of the donors don't either. So I think it's a good opportunity for him to kind of introduce himself and make that case. He's a cerebral person, uh, and, and I think you know when once they get to meet him and they and they hear him, uh, I suspect that they're going to you know take kindly to to his vision and, and his leadership. What do you think happens to the motion to vacate? And I'll go back to my first question: How long will he keep the job? I think they're going to keep the motion to vacate where it is. And the I th threshold stays the same? Sure. And I, but I, I think going through what the conference just went through, there is zero appetite to do something uh, like that. And again, to your point, Anne-Marie, that the decision that Matt Gates and the seven others made, it was not a policy decision. It was a, per it was a decision based on kind of personal grievance. And so uh, I, I don't, even after however they resolved the spending uh, deadline, Ukraine funding or Israel funding, I, I, even if it's not 100 percent, 90 percent or even 80 percent to what the conservatives liking is, I think they'll still kind of give him some leeway. And I don't suspect we'll see the motion to vacate uh, triggered. Like Jim Jordan, this individual is a Trump loyalist. Trump today came out and said, I'm not going to endorse anyone, but I strongly recommend you voting for this person. Sounded like an endorsement to me. Mm -hmm. But what about those 18 Republicans from Biden districts? This is someone who also didn't certify the election. Is this a toxic speaker for them in those districts? Well, I think from Jordan to Scalise, I mean, the, the, I don't think so. I, I don't think that is going to register into these, these members' races. I think what's really important is to fund the government, to provide you know, fund, uh, immediate aid to Israel, uh, and then to kind of get the House going again, because I think that's, as you had mentioned, what constituents are asking Congress to do, get back to work. And so I think with the new speaker, it'll unlock kind of this uh, dysfunction that we've had these past several weeks, get the Congress back to work, and then, you know, hit the campaign trail. Like I said, Speaker Johnson is going to have to raise a lot of money to help provide the resources needed for those races. Yeah, certainly a speaker, a speaker in quotes, allegedly. Um, all right. Thank you so much for Matt Sparks, former communications director for Speaker McCarthy. Some deep insight into what this speaker is uh, has in store for him. Coming to the program, inside the fraud trial, for trial of Sam Bankman-Fried. We'll bring you the highlights next. This is Balance of Power. I'm Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Former crypto mogul Sam Bankman Freed expected to take the stand at his fraud trial as early as tomorrow. Joining us now with details on this, Bloomberg's Zeke Fox. It's great to see you, Zeke. What is he thinking? Well, so far, the trial does not seem to be going well. Yeah. I mean, basically, it's been a parade of Sam Bankman Freed's top lieutenants and former best friends from FTX, one after another taking the stand and saying at great length, hey, I committed fraud, and I'm really sorry, and I did it with that guy with the curly hair sitting over there. <laughs> so his defense hasn't been able to, it doesn't seem like they've been able to raise too many questions about the credibility of the witnesses. Uh -huh. So it seems like, what's he got to lose? Wow. Uh, and he's always been one who, who likes to talk, who thinks he can talk his way out of anything. 
he talked his way to the top. You know, he's great at telling a story. So I'm excited to see how he how he does. Amazing. He talked his way into Washington circles, That's and he was correct. a huge donor. And his one of his uh, partners was a huge donor for Republicans, and he was Democrats. So you worked on so many stories. You have this documentary out, Ruin. What did you learn that was new from it that you would love the audience to learn that maybe know a lot about Sam Bankman fried and the controversy around him, but something you found that you were almost shocked by as well. So back in November, after FTX had collapsed, but just before the cops showed up, I flew down to the Bahamas and talked Bankman fried into giving me an interview at his $30 million penthouse. Amazing. Um, and th we talked for hours and hours and hours. And I think he was basically practicing the story that he's going to be telling tomorrow. Hmm. And let me tell you, it was not a very convincing story. Okay. So, I mean, I'm the, at that point, he hadn't been a, arrested or charged with anything. We didn't, I didn't know that these friends would be testifying against him. And still, it was like, where is all these billions of dollars? Like, what happened to your exchange? Yeah. And he was trying to say that he just wasn't paying attention. It was just like a big mistake. And at one point, he is... He pulled out Excel. He's, like, on his laptop. He's typing. And I'm like, wait, are you trying to tell me that you just misplaced $8 billion? And he's, like, misaccounted and, like, <laughs> smiles about it. And I'm, I'm just like, wait, you went to MIT? You're a trader at Jane Street, like, one of the top yeah. firms on Wall Street? You've been obsessed with getting rich your whole life, and you didn't even count, like, how many billions you had? It just seemed totally implausible to me. So what's going through your mind at this point, that this is someone who's not being honest with you or is in over his head? No, I mean, he seems like, uh, no, completely dishonest. And what's come out at the, at I mean, the trial... you've learned a lot since then. But as you're sitting in the room, what you made of the man? Um, you know, it's funny. He has a weird way of, uh, of being charming. I mean, I think yeah. he really tried his hardest when he was talking with reporters. People who've worked with him at the trial have since testified that he could be very intimidating, he could be mean. With reporters, he really, he really tried his best. So I could see myself getting sucked into his story and, like, I was that? trying my best to believe him, but it's just, like, this doesn't make any sense. And at, an, at another point, I told him he was trying to say it was the fault of the person running his hedge fund, Alameda Research, and that's Caroline Ellison, his, his ex-girlfriend. Uh, I, he was going on and on about this, and I was like, Sam, is you trying to say your ex-girlfriend did it? Oh. Is that your story? Well, that's not going to work if you want to also get back together with her. <laughs> Bloomberg Zeke Fox, what an incredible story and reporting. Tonight, be sure to stick around after our show for the Bloomberg feature-length documentary, Ruin, The Fall of Crypto Exchange, XTX, and Sam Bankman-Fried. That's at 6 p.m. You don't want to miss it. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. President Biden this evening is hosting a state dinner for the Prime Minister of Australia. Earlier today, Kaylee Lines and I spoke with the Australian Resource Minister, Madeline King. Kaylee, fascinating conversation about a topic that is very close to this administration here in Washington. Yeah, critical minerals really is her primary objective while she's here in the U.S. And we really started, Joe, as you know, the conversation with that. She's in these meetings here in D.C. As you said, she's attending the state dinner tonight. So what exactly is it that she's trying to achieve? What are the tenor of her conversations? That was the first question we asked. Here's what she said. The meetings have all been re really terrific, and I've met with some uh, really enthusiastic uh, American officials who have been just great, very welcoming, of course, and the relationship between our two countries is is so important to us in Australia. Uh, my meetings have been around, uh, in my portfolio of resources, uh, the need for critical minerals and how uh, the United States and Australia can work together to make sure we get enough critical minerals out of the ground, but also process them, because they are the metals and minerals that would be needed for clean and green energy technologies into the future. So that's really been my focus here on this visit. Well, that's a pretty big job. It's something that we talk about here almost every day with regard to the EV conversion and yes. the Biden administration's push in this area. And you can't talk about it without talking about China and the role that mm. it will play in what some see as hoarding 
some of these rare earths. How do you see it? Yeah. Well, China's uh, been developing this industry for, for 20 or 30 years, so they're really ahead of most uh, Western democracies. Uh, I think, to be honest, uh, a lot of uh, us uh, for stop mining, uh, to be honest, uh, and uh, China took up that and they've invested in the technology uh, and, and we maybe did not do so as much. And so it's now important for us to make sure we have diversified supply chains because no matter what the product, whether it's critical minerals or rare earths, having options around where you get these things mm -hmm. are going to be really important. And because we know we need these critical minerals and rare earths for the green energy uh, mm -hmm. transition, we want to make sure we can all get hold of them. As yeah. you mentioned, though, not just where you get them, but how you process them. Indeed. And yeah. China's far ahead there. Well, they're far ahead, but I think uh, Australia is increasing its uh, share of responsibility for processing critical minerals. Uh, but we also have very high uh, environmental and governance standards, and I think that's really important uh, to, the, to most of the world, anyway, that, that uh, those standards apply so that we know that when we're uh, extracting these minerals and then uh, processing them, you know, the environment is part of our concern as well. You know, we make sure we do it uh, responsibly and we need to do that so we keep uh, the social licence and community support for mining, which is very much present in Australia and very important to us. Minister, you told Bloomberg about a year ago that breaking China's grip on the critical mineral supply chain was a pipe dream. Is that still how you feel or is that view evolving? Well, I, I think it is, it is very difficult uh, because the, it is, as I said, two or three de decades ahead of the rest of the world. So last year, 96% of lithium spodumene from Australia went to China for processing. So and even if we, of the three lithium hydroxide plants that are currently being built in, in, in Australia, uh, when they're at full production, they'll still only get 10% of, of, of lithium hydroxide production. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take a few years. So you can see it's going to take time, uh, and but we still have to keep at it. We just need to have alternatives. And I think it's important to realise this is just about sensible competition. Uh, Australia has these natural resources. We uh, have some of the largest reserves of lithium, just to name one, the, mm. certainly the largest reserves of nickel. Uh, so we want to make sure we do all that we can, and we will do that with our American friends, uh, to process those minerals in a responsible way for basically the clean energy revolution. And Anne-Marie, she also spoke with Joe and I about the need to invest, that the U.S. and Australia don't need to just invest in each other, but also middle-income countries and places like the continent of Africa to try to develop this infrastructure because they have the material. They just need the ability to actually mine it. Yep, and China is all over the continent when it yep. comes to those raw materials. All right, Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons, thank you so much for bringing this interview with Joe and Kaylee. Coming up in the program, Congressman Steny Hoyer of Maryland will be with us. Coming live from the Capitol next, this is Balance of Power. From the very beginning of this Congress, House Democrats have made clear that we will find bipartisan common ground with our Republican colleagues whenever and wherever possible for the good of the American people. And House Democrats have repeatedly done just that. House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries this afternoon after the election of Mike Johnson to the role of House Speaker. Let's bring in Maryland Congressman and former House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer joining us from the Capitol. Sir, thank you so much for joining us. You already, I know, cast your first vote under the new Speaker. Tell me, do you think this is someone Democrats can work with? Uh, I don't know Mike Johnson very well. He's been elected Speaker. Uh, he's relatively new and hasn't been in the leadership before. So, frankly, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but uh, I think the, his speech today uh, was a speech that talked about working together to reach common ground. Yes, we'd have differences, and I thought that was uh, good. Uh, but as I told him, uh, that is easy to say. It's hard to do. And very frankly, his record uh, over his uh, time in the Congress of the United States has been a very hard-edged message uh, that will not create uh, bipartisanship, uh, but we'll see. Uh, he, he said good things, and I hope that he follows through on those. And if he does, as uh, Leader Jeffries indicated, he will get a positive response uh, from Democrats. We want to work together. 
Uh, and frankly, we did work together, and uh, we saw uh, that we uh, didn't allow the American to, to uh, default on its debts. Uh, we made a, an agreement on what funding levels would be for the coming year, and we did not shut down the government. Uh, all of those were o over 300 votes on those. And on Ukraine, we've had seven votes uh, that had over 300 votes. So we've had a bipartisan, constructive coalition working together. And I hope the new speaker follows uh, that uh, trajectory uh, and doesn't uh, serve simply the hard right on his party as his record would reflect. But I want to give him the, the benefit of the doubt. I had a conversation with him. It was very brief, but it was very positive. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Congressman, a lot of folks have made the point uh, that he doesn't have enough experience to have enough enemies to block his path to the gavel. I don't know if you agree with that, but did you have to Google Mike Johnson this morning? Uh, I don't think I Googled it, but my staff gave me a memo, <laughs> but uh, honestly. But the fact of the matter is, uh, yes, he's new, and I think your point is absolutely correct. He hadn't made enough enemies, as, as obviously others had. After all, the Republicans went through their speaker, their majority leader, and their whip, their three highest officers, and rejected all of them. Uh, and that uh, uh, gives you somewhat of a sense of the challenge that he faces on his side of the aisle. And it took uh, four uh, different people uh, to win the speakership. Uh, the first one mm -hmm. uh, was, and the second one were hard right, uh, and the third one was more towards the center, and he lasted for four hours before Donald Trump uh, told his followers, uh, reject him, and he dropped out. And then we came yeah. to Mike Johnson, who, as you point out, nobody has a lot of record on him, so, uh, uh, but the record that we do have is he's uh, very conservative and therefore, I think, was obviously uh, from... Uh, the Republican uh, standpoint, acceptable to the Freedom Caucus. Obviously, they all voted for him. Uh, but that gives some pause for concern because they do not represent the American people and do not represent the overwhelming majority of Americans who want to see the Congress work together. Uh, so many of their candidates said, I don't want to work with Democrats. And uh, I hope this, this uh, new speaker, Speaker Johnson, does want to work with people who will work with him to achieve positive objectives for the American people. Well, let's talk about some of those items that we're going to need bipartisan support for to see this Congress get them through. The first will be the most immediate, a November 17th potential government shutdown. Now, Speaker Johnson came out and he said he would potentially put on the floor a continuing resolution for January or April. What are you hearing regarding that stopgap measure? Well, I, I, what you just said, he sent out a letter. Uh, he indicated that uh, we would probably have to have or that he would probably support a uh, continuing resolution to keep the government open. That's a positive step. Now, whether he can deliver on that, we'll, we'll see. Unfortunately, he has voted against most of the uh, CRs that have been on the floor in the continuing resolutions, keeping government funded uh, in the past. So it's not a very... Uh, hopeful sign that he has voted against those in the past. Hopefully he will understand shutting down the government is a stupid thing to do. Uh, we avoided it under uh, Speaker McCarthy, but only with the votes of a majority of Democrats and uh, about 20 less uh, Republicans, but we did avoid it. And hopefully uh, Speaker Johnson will lead us to that same end. It was an interesting moment last evening, uh, Congressman, when Congressman Johnson became uh, speaker nominee. He held a very quick news briefing, if we can call it that, flanked by a, a large number of Republican members. And a reporter tried to ask him about his attempt to overturn the 2020 election results. That reporter was met with boos and uh, was told to shut up by another Republican member. This is something that was Miss Fox. That's going I to be that. an issue. That's absolutely you're absolutely right. Virginia Fox told her to shut up, and then she was not allowed to ask another question. Is that going to be the future here for this Republican conference? Every member of the Republican conference voted for this individual who was an election denier. Congressman, how do you work with that? It's sad. 
It's sad that an election denier, it's sad that Donald Trump, charged with numerous crimes, and now his chief of staff apparently saying that they informed him that what he was saying was wrong, uh, and his pursuit of that effort has led a lot of people into legal trouble, including himself. Uh, and this, uh, the new speaker was an election denier, as you say, wrote a, uh, uh, an opinion uh, that uh, Chip Roy, a member of the Freedom Caucus, former uh, Attor Deputy Attorney General or Assistant Attorney General in the state of Texas, said was constitutionally wrong. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's an area of concern. But as I say, he's new. He hasn't been in leadership. We'll have to see what he does. We know what he's said in the past. We know what he's done in the past. Uh, and if he goes down that route, that hard right route, then I think uh, he, he's in for a rough time. Uh, and we're not going to get to the bipartisanship that he talked about and that uh, Leader Jeffries talked about. So hopefully he now sees with the responsibility of running the entire House, not just a faction of the House, uh, seeks out uh, to uh, come together and have agreements that can have a positive result on our legislative record, positive result in helping people, and a positive result in keeping the government open and operating. And um, I might, might also, add, my, I might add, and supporting Ukraine as well as supporting Israel. Well, you led me right there, Congressman. I want to talk about both of those packages. Take a listen to what Speaker Johnson had to say about Israel. Our nation's greatest ally in the Middle East is under attack. The first bill that I'm going to bring to this floor in just a little while will be in support of our dear friend Israel, and we're overdue in getting that done. Congressman, how is your colleagues in the Democratic Party, party dealing with the Israeli skeptics on the progressive wing? Well, let me say, we only had, uh, I think, 10 votes uh, opposed to, to the bill. 400-plus uh, members of the House of Representatives voted for that. So the overwhelming number of Democrats and Republicans voted for the resolution. And, and I was smiling because he says that was going to be the first bill that he would bring to the floor. Frankly, that bill would have come to the floor three weeks ago had it not been for the internal division and divisiveness and dysfunction of the Republican Party, who couldn't select a leader. So that it's ironic that he claims credit for that being the first. Of course it was the first, uh, because it was so important that we pass it three weeks ago in support of our very strong ally, Israel, uh, who was uh, in invaded and a, and a carnage was committed uh, and an act of war by Hamas, who, that is a terrorist organization. So yes, he brought it to the floor because over 400 members were for it and had co-sponsored it. So I'm glad he brought it to the floor. It was the right thing to do. Uh, and it, and I, as I say, it's never too late to do the right thing, and he did the right thing. Congressman but the Steny Hoyer the, of Maryland. Anne -Marie, I, do, I was just going to add, yes, Anne Marie sir. asked me a direct question. The overwhelming number of Democrats yeah. Uh, voted for this uh, piece of legislation. We always appreciate an answer, Congressman. Thank you for your time today and bringing the Democratic point of view on a very important story. We have a Speaker of the House after 22 days without. We also have breaking news now on Bloomberg. Anne Marie, this is just hitting the terminal. Morgan Stanley has chosen Ted Pick to become its new CEO will replace James Gorman after a 14-year run. This transition will take place in January. Pick will uh, be elevated to the top role and join the board. And this individual is credited with spurring a revival in the company's trading business. So um, he's he's been there for three decades. This is a veteran. This isn't someone who's right. a new name. Um, he's known to Wall Street. But wow, four, more than two decades yeah. for Mr. Gorman. It's a big one, and you can read more about it on the terminal uh, just breaking now as we speak. Coming up, former acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney will be with us his view on a historic day in Washington. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Last thing I'm going to say is a message to the rest of the world. They have been watching this drama play out for a few weeks. We've learned a lot of lessons, but you know what? Through adversity, it makes you stronger. 
and yeah. And, and we want our allies around the world to know that this body of lawmakers is reporting again to our duty stations. Let the enemies of freedom around the world hear us loud and clear. The People's House is back in business. The new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, today on the House floor in the rostrum after winning the Speaker's gavel. Let's bring in Mick Mulvaney, co-chair of Actum Strategic Advisors, former acting White House chief of staff in the Trump White House and one of the co-founders of the Freedom Caucus. Mick, it's good to see you and thanks for joining here. We've been talking around this for 22 days now. And I wonder your thoughts on how this works as I try to make sense of this. Maybe that's my first mistake. Kevin McCarthy <laughs> got fired for making a deal with Democrats, if we even call it that, and passing a continuing resolution to keep the government open. This man just got elected to do the same thing. He says he'll put the CR on the floor. And he got a vote from every single member of the Republican conference. How do you explain it? Yeah, and I, I've talked to a couple of folks in Washington today since the, uh, since the new speaker was elected. I don't know Mike very well. Mike got there uh, just as I was leaving. I've met him a couple of times. We worked together when I was in the administration, but I, I don't know him like I know some of the folks that I've been there with for a decade or more. Um, and the folks mm -hmm. I talked to said that they're going to give him a little leeway, a little, a little runway here. And they, the, the conservatives have already committed to, to voting for a short-term CR in order to give them time to do some other things, specifically pass or at least vote on all 12 of the spending bills. That's the exact same thing that cost Kevin McCarthy his job, was requesting uh, a, a short-term CR. So clearly, the attitude on the right is better right now with Mike Johnson than it was towards the end of Kevin McCarthy's speakership. That being said, no one yet has, asked, has, has got me any information about where the center of the party is. I'm talking about the appropriators who hate short-term CRs. Um, there was some discussion, for example, on the right of a full-year CR. That would go over like like, like a turn in a punch bowl with the appropriators, with the spenders, with the centers, with the centers, uh, centers of the party. So um, the first take then is that Mike is going to have a little bit more latitude. But this is, the, as, as I've told people today, that the, the easy part is finished. You got yourself elected speaker. That was the easy part. Now the hard part is you have to be the speaker. And how long do you think he will be speaker, Mick? I mean, is this someone that, like Kevin McCarthy, is given six to nine months? I asked the same question, and the, the same, everybody told me about the same thing, which is we are done, they are done, with motions to vacate for this Congress, okay? that, that, that they will let Mike Johnson run, run the rest of this Congress and then maybe have a discussion after the midterm elections and so forth. They're hoping, of course, they're still in the majority after the next term, after the, uh, the 2024 elections. But everybody I talked to said that Mike looks fairly secure for the rest of this Congress, so another, uh, what, 15 months at least? Hmm. Donald Trump did factor in the end here. He seems to like this idea. Mick, what do you think of the kingmaker or not so much ability here of Donald Trump after going through now four nominees and he had some not very successful endorsements, including Jim yeah. Jordan? Did he actually he give will. Republican members cover to vote for this new speaker today? No, they didn't need it. They don't. This is a, this is really is a personal vote. It, look, Donald Trump, um, is really good, not really good at getting people elected. Okay? We saw that in Pennsylvania, we saw it in Arizona, we saw it several, way too many times in Georgia. Okay? He's not very good at getting people he likes elected, but he is really good at preventing people he doesn't like from getting elected. And that's where he came in wow. with Kevin McCarthy. But he wasn't able to get Jim Jordan across the line. I, I, I feel sh assured that was his first choice. He, he, he sees Kevin, uh, Jim Jordan as a, one of his staunchest supporters. So, and Trump will talk, try and take credit, but I, I don't think if you ask anybody in the room who voted today if Trump moved their vote one way or the other, I, I, I can't imagine that happening. What do you make of the fact that this individual did not certify the elections? Of course, you were out after January 6th. Yeah, yeah, I was out and I quit on January 6th. Um, but yeah, look, I, I just did an interview with a Democrat, and, he's like, and he asked me the same question. I'm like, so let me get this straight. When we talk about 2020, it's us looking backwards. When you talk about 2020, it's okay. I, 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 I imagine there's a lot of people in that chamber who would wish they had that vote over, um, but I don't think it's become disqualifying. Obviously, it hasn't become disqualifying to be speaker. Mike Johnson's going to be judged as speaker from this day going forward, not this day backwards. Yeah. Mick Mulvaney, thank you so much for your time and insight this evening. We really appreciate it. And, Joe, you can check out all these 
stories and more. Finally have a speaker um, on the Washington edition we newsletter. We still can't believe it. On the terminal and online. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, this was not just the fourth nominee, but fifth if you consider the whole year. Uh, fair enough. That, that's absolutely right. And tomorrow we'll be, I guess, cheering the first full day with the Speaker of the House. See you then. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg.